Amy. Hello. Okay. Hello. Nice to see everyone here. Uh, Sabine, a question. Do you want to say something about the book or not? Uh, it's, it's actually a book Amy and I wrote together. What was, when was it? Two years ago, Amy? When we, a year and a half. year and a half, yeah. year and a half ago, when we were uh, sharing a, a writing residence in uh, Normandy, France. And uh, do you want to take over, Amy? <laughs> and uh, we, Sabine had this idea that we would write. Uh, I'm a Zen meditation teacher. I'm American. I live in Paris. Sabine is of Vietnamese descent, immigrant who grew up in France, had no background in Buddhism apart from the fact that her parents had an altar and kind of the way that it was just part of the culture where her parents grew up in Vietnam. And so Sabine had this idea that we would write each of us what our experience of Buddhism or Zen is during the week, but that was it. We had no other ideas. Yeah. So I wrote in English, she wrote in French, and then at the end of the day we met and we translated each other and we came up with this book. Is that okay. okay. So. And, so and, and now we are going to read you poems from our book. Um, and uh, yeah, Amy. And, and maybe I, you can see the poems I see on the screen. Um, when the poem is read in English first, that means I wrote it, that's my poem. If it's read in French first, it's Sabine who wrote it. And I, I, I put read. the name. And the names I are there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Everybody the see the name of the author. Okay. Around and around it goes, the mountain turning turning while going nowhere, the mountain all the while. My skis I point, my eyes I point, my body and mind I point. Into the turning I turn, into just this one turn I turn, into where my being turns I turn, into the white, into the blue I turn, into where nothing lasts I turn, into boundless sky of now, I turn. Elle tourne et tourne en rond, la montagne. Elle tourne et tourne sans aller nulle part, la montagne, tout ce temps. De mes skis, je montre. De mes yeux, je montre. De mon cœur et mon esprit, je montre. Dans le tournant, je tourne. Juste dans ce tournant-là, je tourne. Là où mon être tourne. Je tourne. Dans le blanc, dans le bleu, je tourne. Là où rien ne dure, je tourne. Dans le ciel infini de maintenant, je tourne. Quand j'avais dix ans, je voulais en avoir dix-huit. Partir d'ici, partir dès que, partir loin. De cette petite ville, être grande. À quinze ans, j'étais déjà sur les routes. Fenêtre, bus, métro, train, cave, bras, lit, inconnu, sous emprise, sous des bancs, sans dessus, dessous, sale pute, malsaine, désavouée par sa mère, sans amis, sans comprendre, sans but, sans rien voir, sans plus rien vouloir. Libre, de mourir, de ne pas mourir. Et au milieu, je n'étais plus, je n'avais plus, ni dix ans, ni dix-huit, ni yeux, ni oreille, ni langue, ni corps, ni pensée, ni forme, ni goût, ni figure, ni rien qui fut. Pur ou impur. Quand j'avais dix ans, je voulais en avoir dix-huit. À quinze ans, je voulais encore vivre jusqu'à dix-huit ans. À dix-huit ans, je suis reparti. Bus, métro, autocar, ferry, train, métro, grenier, puis premier étage, dans un monde de lits géants, dans une ville géante. Je suis revenu. Toute petite. When I was ten, I wanted to be eighteen. Get away from here, get away as soon, get away. Far from this little town, be a big girl. At 15, I was already on the road. Window, bus, subways, trains, basements, arms, beds, strangers, under the influence, under benches, upside down. 
dirty, sickening whore disavowed by her mother. Without friends, without understanding, without goal, without seeing anything, without wanting anything anymore. Free to die, to not die. And in between, I was no longer. I was no longer either 10 or 18 or eyes or ear or tongue or body or thought or form or taste or face or anything that was pure or impure. When I was 10, I wanted to be 18. At 15, I wanted to live to be 18. At 18, I left again. Bus, subway, coach, ferry, train, underground, attic and first floor. In a world of giant beds in a giant city, I came back very small. Before a question of knowing or not, already my belly knew without knowing that what I didn't know was all that I would need to know. Although I didn't know about Confucius or about his two lives, the second life starts, he said, when you see that you only have one. My belly knew already about two being one. My belly knew already the words and what they told. Having never left, I am back again, my belly said. I wrote my belly words. I wrote them and then left to seek my way back again. Avant la question de savoir ou pas, mon ventre savait déjà sans savoir ce que je ne savais pas, que je ne savais pas. Et je recommence. Start again. Avant la question de savoir ou pas, mon ventre savait déjà sans savoir que ce que je ne savais pas était tout ce dont j'aurais besoin de savoir. Bien que je ne savais rien sur Confucius ou sur ses deux vies, la deuxième vie commence, il a dit, quand tu réalises que tu n'en as qu'une. Mon ventre savait déjà que deux ne font qu'un. Mon ventre savait déjà les mots et ce qu'il racontait. N'étant jamais parti, je suis à nouveau de retour, mon ventre disait. J'ai écrit les mots de mon ventre. Je les ai écrits, puis je suis parti. Retrouver le chemin du retour. Concombre, fruits, tomate, ail, radis. Ça craque, c'est juteux. Ça pique la langue, ce qu'on lègue à nos enfants. Maman, tu ne manges pas de viande, alors moi non plus. Tu mâches sans répondre que tu es végétarienne depuis que tu as 19 ans. Pas pour les animaux, pour une histoire d'amour. À chaque repas, tu y repenses. À ses yeux, à la mer, au vent, au sable des cornouailles. Manger de la viande briserait votre serment. Tu mâches en te souvenant que tu aimais. La pêche à la mouche dans le vieux Rhône, pas pour la pêche, pour la virer en deux, pêle-mêle à l'avant, à l'arrière, les potes, Sam, Patrick, Momo, la guitare de Yann, les bottes de Chris, l'autoradio de Steph, les merguez, les seaux, les briquets hippo, le pain, les joints, les cassettes, Led Zepp, Bob, Jack Higelin, le thermos, les serviettes, les bières, les cannes, le soleil, les galets, les soupirs, les yeux brillants, les siestes, les rôles, les rires, les dents blanches, l'attente, les bouillons de la rivière, vives et glacées. La symphonie extraordinaire de vos naïvetés ordinaires. À la tombée du jour, les poissons relâchés bondissaient, disparaissaient au loin, nous emportant avec eux. La lune brillait dans le courant. Cucumber, fennel, tomato, garlic, radish. It crunches, it's juicy, it stings the tongue what we transmit to our children. Mommy, you don't eat meat, so I don't either. You chew without replying that you have been vegetarian since you were 19. Not for the animals, for a love story. At every meal you think of it, of his eyes, of the sea, of the wind, of the Cornwall sand. Eating meat would break your oath of love. You chew while recalling that you loved. 
fly fishing in the Vieux Rhone River, not for the fish, for the trip in the Deschevaux, Helmel in front, in back, the friends, Sam, Patrick, Momo, Jan's guitar, Chris's boots, Steph's car radio, the merguez sausages, the buckets, the zippo lighters, the bread, the joints, the cassettes, Led Zepp, Bob, Jacques Higelin, the thermos, the towels, the beers, the rods, the sun, the pebbles, the sighs, the shining eyes, the naps, the burps, the laughs, the white teeth, the wake, the gush of the river, vivacious and icy. The extraordinary symphony of the ordinary knife day. At the end of the day, the freed fish leaped, disappearing in the distance, taking us along. The moon was shining in the flow. Incomparable absolute perfection is just this. A holy tree stump altar bedecked exquisite with undying weeds. Venerable throne of a sacred beer can Buddha. Unsurpassable lord of vacant lot realms. His innumerable arms open to the wild and hungry. To outlaw seekers and left behind to all as they are, to me as I am, scuffed short boots, black coat, jeans, long purple scarf, sitting on an abandoned crate with all that is, the whole of life, the all pervading here and now, on a weekday February morning in the Bronx. People need to mute themselves. Please mute yourselves. Let me mute everybody. Mute all. Okay. Now, Sabine and Amy, unmute yourselves. Okay. La perfection incomparable et absolue, c'est précisément ça. Un moignon d'arbre pour hôtel sacré, délicatement orné de mauvaises herbes immortelles. Le trône vénérable d'un saint Bouddha canette de bière, seigneur inégalable du royaume des terrains vagues. Ses bras innombrables ouverts aux insoumis et aux affamés, aux hors-la-loi et aux laissés pour compte, à tous tels qu'ils sont, à moi tel que je suis. Bottines fatiguées, manteau noir, jeans, longue écharpe mauve, assise sur un cajot abandonné, avec tout ce qui est, la totalité de la vie, l'omniprésent ici et maintenant, un matin de jour de semaine de février dans le Bronx. Ici et maintenant, c'est les cris, c'est les coups. Ici et maintenant, sur le corps, c'est le pire. Ici et maintenant, c'est le mantra, c'est l'esprit. Ici et maintenant, l'esprit est plus fort que le corps. L'esprit est plus fort que le corps, l'esprit que le corps. Que le corps plus que le corps jusqu'à ce qu'il n'y ait plus de corps. De corps plus que les mots, l'esprit est plus fort que le corps. Répéter l'esprit est plus fort que le corps, rend l'esprit plus fort que le corps. Chasse le corps, repose l'esprit dans la barque du mantra. Elle s'appelle ici et maintenant son temporaire. Elle s'appelle aussi l'amour comme un bourgeon qui est clos maintenant ailleurs, ici. Écrire amour et le mot amour n'est plus le fruit sec au noyau stérile, mais un cerisier chargé de fleurs. Calme-toi, respire, pense à l'océan, écris. Écrire l'océan et la peau meurtrie se couvre de sel et tu lèches tes plaies et tu sens les embruns chatouiller tes paupières, elles s'ouvrent avec les mots pour recueillir la joie du monde. Here and now, it's the shouts, it's the blows. Here and now, on the body, it's the worst. Here and now, it's the mantra, it's the mind. Here and now, the mind is stronger than the body. The mind is stronger than the body, the mind than the body. 
than the body, more than the body, until there is no more body, only the words, the mind is stronger than the body. Repeating the mind is stronger than the body makes the mind stronger than the body. Dispels the body, rests the mind in the mantra's vessel. She is called here and now a temporary. She is called love like a bud that opens now elsewhere here. Write love and the word love is no longer. Dried fruit with sterile pit but a cherry tree in full bloom. Stay calm, breathe, think of the ocean, write. Write the ocean and the battered skin is covered with salt and you lick your wounds. And you feel the sea spray tickle, your eyelids they open with the words to collect the joy of the world. Village bell tolls 10 a.m. as trees blossom wildly. What fruit this flush portends escapes my grasp of thought. It matters not. This Norman meadow nave, like the blue sky Duomo of the deep Zen poet patriarch, is all the church I'll ever need. Les cloches du village sonnent dix heures du matin, pendant que les arbres fleurissent éperdument. Le fruit que cette profusion laisse présager échappe à mon entendement. Peu importe, cette nef de pré normand, semblable au duomo de ciel bleu du patriarche zen des poètes bites, est la seule église dont j'ai besoin. Il est midi, clament les cloches, aujourd'hui, hier. Derrière les carreaux de la fenêtre au châssis rouge, le grand cerisier sauvage des oiseaux des bois gorgés de bouquets de fleurs blanches. Le vent est là, il les effeuille, comme il ôtait déjà les pétales du cerisier de l'immeuble de vaux en velin le dimanche où j'ai trouvé ma mère à côté de la baignoire, endormie dans une mare rouge foncée au milieu d'une flaque de soleil. Pas un bruit et la fenêtre encadrait l'envolée de fleurs et cette douceur infuse jusqu'aux cerises acides de l'arbre d'après celui de la maison au volet bleu. Tous les matins, à val de reuil j'ouvre les yeux pour revivre la mort, des pétales virevoltants, et je ne sais pas si je suis aujourd'hui, hier, c'est alors que les cloches sonnent. It's noon, the bells toll, today, yesterday. Behind the panes of the red-framed window, the tall wild cherry tree birds woods filled with bouquets of white flowers. It strips them like it once plucked the petals from the cherry tree of the building in vaux en velin the Sunday when I found my mother next to the bathtub, asleep in a dark red pond in the middle of a puddle of sun. Not a sound, and the window framed the flowers in flight and this softness distilled in the sour cherries of the next tree at the house with the blue shutters. Every morning in Val de Rey, I open my eyes to relive the death of whirling petals. And I don't know if I am today, yesterday, it's then that the bells ring. Ce matin, je suis partie marcher, une pomme verte dans la main, tête nue sous les nuées sombres, oreilles pleines des sons de cloche de l'église Saint-Ouen de Léry. Aussi petite que les boutons d'or dans l'herbe, j'ai suivi un chemin de terre, un papillon orange, la rivière de l'heure, son couple de cygnes pêcheurs. J'ai traversé des pépillements d'oiseaux invisibles, une avrier de pétales de fleurs de merisier, trempé mes doigts dans la mare, effaçant mon reflet, et j'ai attendu qu'elle revienne, la femme dans l'image. Une fois que la boue se fut déposée, j'ai cherché, je n'ai rien vu. En levant les yeux, j'ai vu les branches bouger.
This morning I went walking, a green apple in my hand, head bare under dark clouds, ears filled with the ringing, with the ringing bells of Saint Juan de Mary Church. As small as the buttercups in the grass, I followed a dirt path, an orange butterfly, the Ur River, its pair of fishing swans. I passed through the chirping of invisible birds, a soft sprinkle of wild cherry petals. Dipped my hands in the pond, erasing my reflection, and I waited for her to return, the woman in the image. Once the mud had settled, I searched, I saw nothing, Raising my eyes, I saw branches moving. I saw an apple when I finally stopped to sit and look. I saw that when I didn't see the apple was not an apple. I didn't see the apple was an apple. I saw that when I saw the apple was an apple, I saw the apple was not an apple. I saw that when I saw the apple was an apple and not an apple, I saw the apple was all there was to see. J'ai vu une pomme quand je me suis enfin arrêtée pour m'asseoir et regarder. J'ai vu que quand je ne voyais pas que la pomme n'était pas une pomme, Je ne voyais pas que la pomme était une pomme. J'ai vu que, quand je voyais que la pomme était une pomme, je voyais que la pomme n'était pas une pomme. J'ai vu que, quand je voyais que la pomme était une pomme et pas une pomme, je voyais que la pomme était tout ce qu'il y avait à voir. That's it. Thank wait, you. I think, wait, wait, before I think, we, I think everyone needs to applaud. So could unmute yourselves just for the applauding because I think this was an amazing reading. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Karen, you and me. I'm unmuted. I now I want to thank you, thank you again and again. This was an, for both of you. This is an amazing reading, and now I, I think I want to introduce to you Dara Banat, and from the city I run from, Dara. Just I'll just say to Amy and to Sabine that these poems are going to continue to resonate with me. So thank you both of you for your individual readings and your beautiful collaboration. Um, I'm just going to read a, a sh uh, kind of short selection from um, a chapbook recently out that's titled The City I Run From, Poems of Tel Aviv. And the first is titled, These Are the Sidewalks of Tel Aviv. And it's after the poem uh, by Tuvia Rubner, the Israeli poet, called A Postcard from Tel Aviv. These are the bike lanes. They're close to the sidewalks, be careful. This is the square where someone who cared about peace was killed. They painted his footsteps black where he fell. I push the stroller past them every day. My son plays in the shadow of peace. This is the city that holds me as I sleep and as I lie awake. People walk their dogs at 3 a.m. In this city, when I hear helicopters, I stop what I'm doing. When you hear more than one, it's serious. I don't know why I keep returning to the city that's never been my own. Find me a place that speaks my mother tongue. Find me a home in Queens. Find me a home in Brooklyn. Why Tel Aviv, hot, no rain until December? Yet I live to feel those drops, to watch a downpour through the window. Is that why I've come back again because Tel Aviv keeps me waiting? This is the city I run towards, then from, then towards, and still from. 
No matter how many years go by on these streets, they're foreign. Rodetsky, Zeitlin, Ibn Virol. When I drive, though, I don't have to think about where I'm going. My body knows where to turn, which intersections to avoid. Maybe I hold on to Tel Aviv because this is the city that wrote me my first poems in a language it doesn't know very well. Graffiti in English is often misspelled. The Messiah is coming. I doubt the Messiah is coming. Tel Aviv doesn't care enough. Tel Aviv cares about vegetables from the shook, perfect tomatoes, perfect pita, hummus, green olives for my son. Tel Aviv cares about cold coffee and museums. Here's the white sand on the beach. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. I've stood there in the early morning alone. The water changes by the hour. The second po poem that I'll read is titled Ascent. And the epigraph is a, a, from a section of Song of Myself, of Walt Whitman's Song of Myself. Whitman plays a big part in this uh, collection and a lot of my um, other poems also. Uh, so this is section 25. We also ascend dazzling and tremendous as the sun. We found our own, oh my soul, in the calm and cool of the daybreak. Ascent. Inside a minaret, balancing on bricks worn by thousands of years of prayer. I reach for the highest stones, no time to hope they will hold me. Outside, the sunlight is red stained glass, stones castle shape, flecked pink and pewter. Below is Cairo with shifting currents. Above is blue silence. I was here, I'll think, one day. And the next poem is titled, In the Sinai Desert. And I just want to say that a poem by Karen that she read at a recent reading has inspired me to, to share this tonight because she has a poem about a woman uh, in the Sinai Desert following Moses, lost um, and found. In the Sinai Desert, one, approach the Red Sea at dawn as if in worship, kneel. Two, rest your palms on the surface of the water. Three, let patterns of salt form on your fingers like lattice work. Four, let the patterns dissolve. Life can't help its own fragility. And I'll share with you a poem called, The City is Giving Me a Sun, from July 2017. Hallelujah. We packed five hats for you to wear after you're born. I imagine the gray one falling over your eyes, whatever color they will be. And they turned out to be blue. We are planning to drive you home in a car seat. We pushed you in your stroller, as it turns out. And we'll settle you into a crib with wood slats, draw a bath with almond oil. We'll raise you on Zeitlin Street and play in Dubnov Park. We'll walk back and forth in the shade of David Hamelech Boulevard. I can't promise you everything but I promise David Hamelech is the most beautiful boulevard in Tel Aviv. Then you'll run among the birds and bikes on Rabin Square. Things go fast in the city. We'll sit by the, by the fountain with the orange fish. You'll learn to say water. You'll learn to say mine and you will be our son. The next poem is titled Recitation for Walt Whitman. Someone puts their hands over my eyes on Robin Square. I can't believe it's Walt Whitman. We walk together to bus 25 
and take it to Schenken Street. We walk past shops and cafes and end up sitting on a bench that overlooks the sea. Waves and boats are falling and rising, falling and rising. I need Walt Whitman to help me understand why life takes so much more than it gives sometimes. Walt Whitman pulls a leaf from my hair and it blows towards the sea, maybe trying to show me that however long life is or isn't, the world she's just beginning. And the last poem I'll share from this chapbook is titled, The Age I Am to Myself. Also, after an epigraph from Song of Myself, section one, I, now 37 years in perfect health begin, hoping to cease, not till death. That's of course Whitman himself. When Walt Whitman, meaning Walt Whitman about himself. When Walt Whitman wrote the line that he was 37 in perfect health, in fact, he was decades older. I guess the body is the body, but you can imagine that day when you swam in a lake, lay on a silver rock, legs bent, arms behind your head, sun on your face, feel the heat of the rock on your skin, track the divots of beetles as loons dive after them. I now am 36. I guess this poem is a fine place to be 36. It's a fine place to say that the age I am to myself is 26. I'm standing knee deep in the Mediterranean. Waves break at the shore, crash into my legs. I'm wondering, how long ago the sand shifting in pockets under my feet was earth, bone, shell. Due west is the horizon. I'm wondering if I could swim to another country, which seems so possible because the sky and water, they'd lift me. And now, Sabine, will you come back to me so we can read together from our uh, bilingual uh, yeah, collection? Uh, can we unmute everyone to, uh, to, to uh, applaud? Because I think that was an amazing uh, series. Uh, can we do that? <laughs> Thank you for being here. It means a lot. Thanks so much. Now, to me for everyone. Now we're to all going to be quiet again. Yeah, everybody's muted. I'm going to unmute again. And Sabine, I don't see you. Are you? I'm here. Oh, there you are. I hear <laughs> your voice. That, that, that's great. That's what we need right now. So um, this is going to be just uh, a few poems from a bilingual edition. So uh, these are poems that Sabine very generously translated um, from English to French, ones that she had selected mostly from a past poetry collection called In the Absence. So the poems in English are mine and then with Sabine's uh, translation to French. Prayer I do not know. No one is here, just me alone. I close my eyes and try to remember your face, its light, your fingers, their light touch, your laugh, the lightness. I recite a prayer that is my own. May we live a thousand years together in another life. Prière obscure. Comment prier pour toi, personne, ici, moi, seul? Je ferme les yeux, tente de voir ton visage, sa lumière, tes doigts, l'affleurement, ton rire, la légèreté. Je récite une prière qui est mienne. Puissions-nous vivre mille ans ensemble dans une autre vie. The next poem is titled The Name of the Father. 
any sign of your life was a slip of the tongue. So I did not speak your name. As if it sounds, I held all our pain and I could capture them like air, breathe them into my lungs. There, they would not become the only sounds I'd ever hear in rainstorms, slammed doors, footsteps, phones ringing, pages turning, twigs breaking. So I did not speak your name. I did not speak of its meaning. Who is like God? Le nom du Père. Tout ce qui pouvait révéler ton existence était un lapsus. Ainsi, je ne prononçais pas ton nom, comme si sa sonorité contenait toute notre souffrance et que je pouvais la saisir, la respirer, la laisser pénétrer mes poumons là où elle ne deviendrait pas les seuls sons que j'ai jamais entendus. Dans les averses, les portes claquées, les pas, les sonneries téléphones, les pages qu'on tourne, les brindilles qu'on casse. Ainsi, je ne prononçais pas ton nom, je ne révélais pas sa signification, semblable à Dieu. The next poem is titled, Some Deaths. Some deaths are buried in shame, like a gravestone is buried in leaves. These are the stones that no one kneels before, not to pray, not to clear away debris. Somewhere, someone waits to see the stone turn from gray to white in winter. They imagine the name carved in the granite as if in the cursive of God. They would pass their fingers along each letter, scratch the dirt from the letters with their nails, speak aloud to the fallen, if only shame had not buried the dead in silence. Certaines morts sont ensevelies sous la honte comme une tombe sous les feuilles. Elles sont les pierres tombales devant lesquelles nul ne s'agenouille ni pour prier ni pour déblayer. Quelque part, quelqu'un attend de voir la pierre grise blanchir en hiver en imaginant le nom gravé dans le granit. Comme écrit à la main par Dieu, des doigts effleuraient les lettres, des ongles enlèveraient la terre logée dans les creux, on s'adresserait à voix haute aux disparus si la honte n'avait enseveli les morts sous le silence. And the last poem I'll read is uh, called Smoke, and it's for Ashley Williams, who's one of my oldest and dearest friends. Smoke. The towers, they burned. This was actually written um, marking 9-11. Uh, so um, it brought this poem back for me as well, recently. The towers they burned. You and I, we stood on the pier. In the distance, black smoke plumed upwards while we didn't move except to put our hands to our faces. That year, we both had a parent whose mind was being put out like a pile of embers losing heat. We prepared for none of this before the towers fell, before your mother and my father fell away. Once we'd gone to the pier and written packs not to smoke any more cigarettes. We set the packs on fire and laughed as the wind drowned the ashes in the bay. Fumé pour Ashley Williams. Les tours, elles ont brûlé. Toi et moi, on se tenait debout sur la jetée. Au loin, une noire colonne de fumée s'élevait face à nos corps immobiles. Mais nos mains ont trouvé nos visages. Cette année-là, nous avions chacune un parent dont on éteignait l'esprit. Mon seau de braise se refroidissant, il nous a fallu improviser avec la chute des tours, celle de ta mère, celle de mon père, dans l'absence. Un jour, nous sommes allés jusqu'à la digue. Nous avons signé le pacte de ne plus jamais fumer de cigarettes. Nous y avons mis le feu avant de rire éperdument avec le vent qui noyait les cendres dans la baie. Thank you, Sabine. Thank you.
don't do it. Oh. And I think we're going to go back to mute. <laughs> we'll go back. And uh, before, before I go back to mute, I'm going to introduce Karen, who, not, who does not need much introduction for us all, but she'll be reading um, from this collection, uh, first poems of her own, and then again with Sabine. Um, can I ask, can I ask uh, Ezzy to just, for the first poem, just show the picture and let me read it because let me, let me say something first about this, this collection. It was definitely Sabine who made the collection because I didn't dare to publish some of these poems. Um, some of them were in my drawer and hidden and some of them uh, she made me write. And I think the cover one is the one that she made me write. And I'd like to tell you about this. Old photo. The boy in the middle. No, go back to the picture. <laughs> go back to the picture, Izzy. Because you won't know who the picture is. About. The boy in the middle is Alan's father, Benny. He was proud to play the army drum in the Great War. Next to him, with the biggest bow, is Frida who was bitter that she was brought back to Lida in such a time of hardship. She was probably calculating a way to escape to the land of gold. Her hand is on my mother, who will make it through, no matter what obstacles life presents. The girl with the short hair is Marion. She knows only broken hopes and tears. The only, th the other three are mother's sisters. Those who were still at home when the photo was staged. None of the siblings made it more than two decades past this shot. Malka, almost cut out of the picture, fought the Germans with mines until she lost. Bluma in the middle died from typhoid and the other sister Mira was murdered. Here they are now, each one looking at you, each from their own complete world. Now you can go to the French. Vieille photo. Le garçon au centre est celui qui c'est le père d'Alain, Benny. Pas peu fier d'avoir été tambour d'une fanfare militaire pendant la Grande Guerre. À ses côtés, avec le plus grand nœud, c'est Frida. Amer d'avoir été ramenée à Lida en des temps aussi durs. Elle est sûrement en train de calculer sa fuite vers la contrée de l'or. Sa main est posée sur ma mère, qui réchappera de tous les obstacles de la vie, quels qu'ils soient. La fille aux cheveux courts, c'est Marion. Elle ne connaît que pleurs et espoirs brisés. Les trois autres, ce sont les sœurs de maman qui vivaient encore chez leurs parents quand la photo a été mise en scène. À peine deux décennies après ce cliché, plus aucun des frères et sœurs n'était encore en vie. Malka, presque exclue de l'image, a combattu les, les Allemands avec des explosifs jusqu'à sa perte. Bluma, au centre, est morte de la typhoïde et l'autre sœur, Mira, a été assassinée. Les voici maintenant, chacun d'eux vous scrutant depuis leur monde entier respectif. I think the next poem is called Refugees. My parents would never go back to Lida. For them, it was a grave an open pit they had escaped once that would swallow them whole should they ever draw near. There was nothing she could tell me without crying, even about the house in the marketplace, the chickens in the yard, 
the synagogue next door for which grandfather would wake the neighbors banging on their shutters, prayers, Jews. And my father too said nothing, even though their parents lived next door and the grandmothers met on the, their doorsteps each dusk to share their moment of air, and perhaps the gossip of the day. <coughs> so many years of Lida, so many bodies of so many hearts no longer beating, Rarely was any one name on the lips of my mother without all the others pouring from her eyes. And for me too, it is impossible to return and not to. Refugié. Mes parents refusaient de retourner à Lida. Pour eux, un cimetière à sel ouvert dont ils avaient réussi à s'échapper et qui les goberait tout entier s'ils en approchaient à nouveau. Elle ne pouvait rien m'en dire sans pleurer, même sur la maison, place du marché, sur les poulets dans la cour, sur la synagogue attenante pour laquelle grand-père réveillait les voisins en tapant sur leur volet, à la prière, les juifs Mon père non plus ne pipait mot, alors que ses parents vivaient juste à côté et que les grands-mères se retrouvaient sur le seuil de leur maison chaque soir pour partager des bols d'air et peut-être les cancans du jour. Tant d'années à Lida Tant de corps, de cœurs inertes, si rare qu'un nom sur les lèvres de ma mère n'en fit pas couler d'autres de ses yeux. Pareil pour moi, il m'est aussi impossible d'y retourner que de ne pas le faire. Je <coughs> My grandmother was turned into soap. It was clear she was too weak to work. So the doctors took her to the infirmary, gave her a lethal injection that rendered in, gave her a lethal injection that rendered her into something useful. She wasn't fat. From what my dear aunt said, she was nearsighted bookish, shy, and had something wrong with her kidneys. Her daughters tried to cover for her, to do her work as well as their own, but the guards could tell, and took her away to the other side of the camp, the infirmary. Sometimes an image of her comes into my mind, although I've never even seen a photograph bending over a newspaper by a candle, using well every moment of light. Ma grand-mère a été changée en savon. Il était clair qu'elle était trop faible pour travailler. C'est pourquoi les docteurs l'ont emmenée à l'infirmerie, lui ont fait une injection mortelle, puis l'ont convertie en quelque chose d'utile. Elle n'était pas grosse. D'après les dires de ma chère tante, elle était myope, timide, studieuse, et elle souffrait des reins. Ses filles ont tenté de la couvrir, en faisant à la fois leur travail et le sien. Mais les gardes l'ont remarqué. Ils l'ont emmenée de l'autre côté du camp, à l'infirmerie. Il arrive qu'une image d'elle traverse mon esprit, bien que je n'ai jamais vu de photo d'elle. Courbée sur un journal, éclairée par une chandelle, elle profite de chaque instant de lumière. Sutov um, was the only was the only uh, uh, concentration camp where they did that, where they made soap. <clears throat> Night travel for my parents. On that night in Danzig, the trains did not run. You sat in the bus station till almost dawn, knowing that if you could not get out, the invaders would find you, grind you among the first under their heels. Towards morning came, an announcement came of a bus, and without knowing where it would go, you raced to the stop. But the Nazis were there first, and you watched as they finished their search, checking each traveler for papers, jewelry, a Jewish nose, 
Among the passengers, you recognized a familiar face, a German woman sitting with someone else you'd seen in the neighborhood. They winked a greeting, waited for the soldiers to leave, and jumped out, pushing you up in their place. Thus, you escaped to Berlin, remaining alive by keeping silent through the long train ride from Berlin to Cologne in a car filled with staring German soldiers and arrived the next day in Holland, black with fear and transportation. Voyage de nuit pour mes parents. Cette nuit-là, les trains ne sont pas partis de Gdansk. Tu es restée assise à la gare routière jusqu'au point du jour en sachant que si tu ne parvenais pas à sortir de là, les occupants te trouveraient et tu serais parmi les premières à être broyée sous leurs talons. Au petit matin, une annonce a retenti d'un bus et sans savoir où il allait, tu as couru vers l'arrêt. Mais les nazis étaient arrivés les premiers et tu les as observés pendant qu'ils terminaient leur fouille, examinant chaque voyageur pour voir s'il avait des papiers, des bijoux, un nez juif. Parmi les passagers, tu as reconnu un visage, une femme allemande assise de près de quelqu'un que tu avais vu dans le quartier. Ils t'ont salué d'un clin d'œil, ont attendu que les soldats s'éloignent, puis ont sauté hors du bus après t'avoir poussé vers leur place. C'est ainsi que tu as pu fuir pour Berlin, rester vivante en restant silencieuse durant le long trajet en train, de Berlin à Cologne dans un wagon plein de soldats allemands te dévisageant, et arriver en Hollande le lendemain, bleu de peur, noir de transport. This is the last of, the, of this book I'm going to read. Making peace with swine. My parents escaped from Nazi Danzig to a pig farm in Gloucestershire. After years of cowering in bed, sure he'd been found and beaten to death, suddenly my father was called out each day by the pigs under the window. They didn't remain long in Gloucester. My mother wanted to find other survivors, even though it meant living in the Blitz. But my father always remembered those pigs who identified him early on as the carrier of slops and woke him every morning to remind him that he had something important to do with the life that was saved. Faire la paix avec les porcs. Mes parents ont fui la Danzig nazi pour une ferme porcine dans le Gloucestershire. Après des années passées, recroquevillé dans son lit, certain qu'on le trouverait et qu'on le battrait à mort, mon père soudain était appelé à sortir chaque jour par les porcs sous sa fenêtre. Ils ne se sont pas éternisés à Gloucester. Ma mère voulait retrouver d'autres rescapés, même si ça voulait dire vivre sous le blitz. Mais mon père se souviendrait toujours de ces porcs, pour qui il est vite devenu le porteur de déchets et qui le réveillait chaque matin pour lui rappeler qu'il avait quelque chose d'important à faire avec la vie qui avait été épargnée. I must admit that this book is uh, what they say, what they call in Yiddish, faltaicht and faltbesselt, uh, that it is better in French than in English. And now I want to make it a little lighter maybe that's because uh uh because of the, the 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 fact that that book is so hard i wrote another one called a word in edgewise that's on kindle and uh and hard and soft cover a word in edgewise ladies from the bible tell their tales i'll just read one or two of them it ain't necessarily Well, you may wonder why he fashioned them at all. Those vessels, those wombs. And he could have just taught Adam how to remove his own rib, make his own sons. After all, most are not significant enough to mention by name for generations to come. 
but somehow they are always the cusp of the narrative, the troublemakers, the heroines, the clefties. I, I'm going to skip this one. I think I've gone way over my time and go to the next one of Sodom. You know, these, these women that you know well, but you haven't heard them tell their stories. Look, look at the light. See the sky go bright in the fire. Burning up last night, we were one. I want you to stay in my eyes. Oh, the wildest nights. Loving the men and women of Sodom. All have been held in my arms. Before us now empty days, no joy, no luscious pain, one life, one love, one Lord. I turn around and will myself to reunite with my ruined world, to weep and to salt. Um, here's what, this is Hagar. You know, you don't have to read the whole, you remember her. You remember me, Hagar. I wouldn't have believed it after all we meant to each other, those lonely nights when Abram took off on his desert wanderings. She was the one who offered to share him, you know. It was a kind of triangle, some nights with her, some with him, some alone listening to my parents as the way I'd listen to the way listening, the way I'd listened to my parents as a child before they sold me to those monotheists. I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip a couple and go to Joseph and me because I think we have uh, Joseph. Remember Potiphar's wife. Uh, and all this terror, you know, how she's been accused uh, because she tried to seduce uh, Joseph. But we know about Joseph. Joseph and me. How could I have known even his brothers found him an insufferable prig when I saw him in the doorway, his boyish torso framed by the light? How could I have known it was a game he plays? with everyone more innocent than thou. I see a kid striking poses in the field whenever I look out the window and I say, hey, I know guys your age are hungry and shy, and I've seen the way you look at my thighs. And he says, oh lady, I'm in charge of your husband's house, but it wouldn't be nice to take his wife. We men have an agreement about sharing chattel. You're right. I should have known enough to stop there. If I'm the boss's wife, my body's not mine to screw. But who could would have thought a slave could refuse the offer of an equal? So I got left holding the rope, that, the robe that reeked of his refusal, feeling like a f fool and wishing I'd had sense to dress up as an anonymous whore. I get my reward, like Tamar did, only a few pages before. You have to, you have to go back and see what, what happened with Tamar and her father-in-law. Uh, and now, the golden calf. I'm going to take my earrings off for this. You have to admit the appeal of a God made from your earrings, a part of your purest, loveliest dream, the very lobe of your allure. It's the same God that emerges from your loins in the dance, the same God who gives such joy and possession, the same God who says, 
all passion, all truth is in your moments of greatest pleasure. And then there's the opposite kind, you know, there's all these sexy women, but there's, the, there's those, you know, those gold diggers. Uh, someone is going to kill, someone is strike me dead for this. Uh, Beth Shiva, who, if you remember, was bathing on the roof. Uh, said, what is she doing bathing on the roof? I married Uriah for his glory in battle, bathed on the roof because he was never far from war. I bathed on the roof so that only a man higher than me would see. Only a man higher than mine would be able to replace him. Only a man higher than mine would see who I was. I bathed on the roof, made love to the air, the jasmine filling the dusk, the water cooling my dusky skin, the night descending on my opening flesh. I married Uriah for his glory. On the roof that night, I woke to what I had not known of love. A man higher than mine saw me on the roof, watched my waking, brought me to the towers of Jerusalem. I'm still over, but I, there's two more I wanted, I have to do if it's okay. Shul, this is the final poem uh, of, of uh, this collection. So I'm sitting here in my favorite place in the women's balcony of the Kippa Lishul, just above the place where they read the Torah, and I can almost make out the letters. Of course, I'm forbidden to know the language it's written in, but fortunately my companions can tell me the stories firsthand, except for Eve and Lilith, who sit on opposite sides of the benches and glare at each other. Everybody has something to say. You should have been there, says Rebecca, when I first saw those jewels. <sighs> You'd think I'd have the sense to figure out why they sent the servant to court me instead of the bridegroom himself. Talk about blind matches, Tamara intervenes. I got two loser husbands, and I was lucky to get one more chance to get some seed before my biological clock ran out from below. The Torah readers stop the ceremony, bang on the table, and raise their faces at us to shout, Sha! And we lower our voices for a moment. Then the old ladies begin their harsh whispering. Me, I was fine before the flood. But can you imagine what it was like hanging around an old man who knew he was the only righteous one in the world? At least he didn't try to kill his son. Sarah says from the corner, I had to deal with a traumatized kid for the rest of my life. Kvetch, 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 I suddenly intervene. We could go on forever, but we just repeat ourselves over and over every year. Now, I have one poem that I want to end with, and I hope you will uh, forgive me for it, but it's about today. You know, in, we're in going into isolation again in Israel. And I thought we should think about this for a moment. In Genesis, it says it is not good that the man should be alone. But sometimes it is good for a person to be alone. Come on, who needs to see how much ice cream you eat sitting opposite the fridge with the door open and the light illuminating the room? Sometimes it's good for a person to be alone. How else can you stay in your pajamas all day looking out the window at the global warming outside and wondering whether, when it will be the right time to leave your flat? Sometimes it's good for a person to be alone. Before the holy days, you may concentrate on the wrongs you've done to others and how you can increase their, their intensity next year when they try to ruin you again. 
Sometimes it's good for a person to be alone. And if, if you have little children and they hang on to your sleeves and beg for more candy, toys, attention, time with the computer, it is good that no one else knows the foul language you can use alone with no stranger to hear. Sometimes it is good for a person to be alone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now I'm going. Now we're going to unmute so that you can applaud everybody. And now some of those questions and some of those things that you said on chat, we have ten minutes to answer. Uh, so if you have questions, thank you, thank you. So if you have questions before we thank everybody, uh, finally, because I think that uh, Amy Dara. Sabine uh, and, and Ezia over there in the corner uh, did amazing jobs. But before we do that, do you have something to say to one of the uh, to one of the poets? Because I have questions. I have I have a question for Sabine because Sabine. How do you how do you cut open your veins like that? How do you because um, you did it to me? You made me say things or or, or publish things that I would never think of, um, and, and you do it for yourself. You do it for others. Uh, I find that an amazing control and an amazing depth. Courage. Courage. You mean when, when I'm reading? What do you mean by? Like, when, when you're reading, when you're translating, when you're writing. I, I just really care. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. And I only translate what I really love. So that helps, I think. You've, it, it certainly does. I'm sure that other people have questions, and I'm sure that you're, uh, you need to be unmuted to ask them. But you can raise your hand and, and if, you, if you're muted, and, um, and the master will unmute you. Uh, I had questions. I am holding back. Sabine, this is Michael. Michael. I'm from Jerusalem. Um, I think I'm sorry. Somebody making a noise. What Karen was asking was this. Um, in one of the poems that you wrote, that you read, you describe, it seems like your mother in a pool of red water. I don't know if that's biographical or not, but okay, where does the courage come from to write that? And, and how you manage to transmit that to Karen to have the audacity to start a poem that says, my aunt or my grandmother, I've forgotten, was turned to soap. I don't know. It's, it's a very difficult question. First of all, yes, everything is is biographical, autobiographical. Um, I can't. I, I'm afraid I can't answer your question. I, I don't know. I would say very commonplace things such as it comes from the heart, um, uh, it comes from the body, the writing com comes from the body necessarily. I think it's not, it's, it's the, the words, the words cannot be detached from the body. It comes from the belly, from the body. It is born in, in the body. Um, 
this connection is essential. Uh, and, and I think that's the only way you can move your reader. And uh, if, if you don't move your reader, um, there's no point really. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Uh, it's, it's quite a difficult question, I find. <laughs> Sorry. I, I think it's, it's an unanswerable question. Uh, because if you knew, you wouldn't do it, right? <laughs> if you knew how to do it, and, and it just if you had the technique, uh, you know, if you had the formula of how to answer that question, you wouldn't be doing it with that kind of feeling. Yeah, and my, Michael spoke about courage. Um, yeah, writing is, is about courage. If you don't have courage, you don't write. I mean, or you, I mean, writing poetry, okay, writing literature, novels um, is about courage. Otherwise, you would write, um, I don't know, recipes or whatever. Um, it's about, okay, it's going to sound very banal, but it's about surviving, really, I think. I, I, I couldn't live without writing. Writing basically saved my life. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Somebody saved Sabine. <laughs> no, the, the writing saving me is fun. I don't need any, anybody, anyone. Thanks, Karen. <laughs> i say something. Uh, I think that uh, Sabine's superpower is her vulnerability. And that's something that uh, we as poets should all learn how to uh, expose. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She's brave about her vulnerability and she gets to the truth and we feel the truth and that's what kids home have been always lovely and i can add just that she helps others to find their own truth you know like th through this act of translating she she sometimes can reveal things that you know weren't even heard initially or felt initially and so so she adds in that way as well I'm, I'm, I think I'm just trying to find the, the voice, the right voice. Uh, first of all, if I translate your poems, it's because I heard a voice in it that is very powerful. And so I personally choose to translate your poems because your, your voice moved to me. And then, and then in the translation, I'm, I'm trying to, to find that voice again, not, not that very voice of yours, but you know, the, an equivalent moving voice that comes from here and from here and and um, and, and, and and when you translate, I mean the translators here all know um, you, you it, it's it's about drama really. It's it's like it's a, you're in, it's a theater. You have to read out loud what you're writing, you have to read out loud, what you're translating and, you, and hear how it sounds, if it sounds right, if it's, if it's off, it's, if it sounds powerful. That's all. <laughs> um, yeah, you all write uh, from a country that is not your country of origin. This probably gives you another access, right? I think it's certainly true of Amy, who could probably answer that question. Uh. Um, that's interesting. Uh, it's an interesting question. And I'm curious to know, Karen, why, why you would say it's mostly true of me, um, more than the others of you? Or? Because I know the others better. <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, okay. Um, I, yeah, I... I think that in, as, a, as a poet, uh, being in a, quote, foreign land 
and functioning mainly in a foreign, I function mainly in French in my daily life. Um, I speak French at home with my family, although my children are bilingual, so we speak some English, but um, it does change my experience of the world and the experience of the language. And I think that I write my, the way that I use English is American English is different than other American poets. Um, the rhythms, the, the usage sometimes. Uh, and it does, it does, it is very important to my work. Um, I might add too that someone said something about um, if, I think Karen said, if you know what you're doing, then you're not doing it. Um, and, and that being in a foreign culture and a foreign language helps a lot to enter that place of not knowing. And for me, that place of not knowing is where I can be most intimate with what is mm -hmm. and come to that, to the heart and the truth or whatever you want to call it. Um, there's there's not the same separation you know when you translate you have to eliminate the word that you know you know so if i have a glass i have to take away the english word glass so that i can find the french word to put there if i'm stuck on the english word i won't be able to find the french word mm -hmm. and it's the same with this everyday living if, if i'm stuck on a reference point um then the poetry will not be true, I think. It's, it's really, so that's a really interesting question that I don't think about too much. Um, but I think it's very true. And I'd be interested to hear what the three of you have to say as well, because you're also living, I'm assuming you're not native Israelis. I know Sadine isn't, but. Uh, sure. Uh. Sabine certainly has a great deal to say about it. Dara has a great deal to say about it, especially as Dara is writing about Tel Aviv and the, your relationship to Tel Aviv um, that is a very uh, strange city, a very different kind of city than, than uh, your home city. Yeah. Um, I... I Life has brought me to be living here for over, you know, I would say a decade and a half, um, which I hadn't like planned on exactly. It was like a lot of things happened to kind of like keep me here. And then I, you know, and then I left and then, and then came back. And so there's this kind of, really rich history just between what you know between myself and this place um that is kind of always being worked out and always somewhat in conflict but is also very enriching um and really does kind of pop up in the poems like i think that poems sometimes like sometimes we want them to be about certain things i think and sometimes they want to be about certain things and oftentimes for me, it's, it's, a, it's a question of getting beyond what I want the poem to be and like letting the poem decide. And Tel Aviv just kind of like crops up in there. Um, and I think the part that has really been like generative is that it's been a space room where I am different, where I sort of am other by virtue of the language, of the predominant language being Hebrew. Um, of course, with Arabic speakers as well and people from other uh, you know, many other places living here, but, um, you know, I feel a constant sense of difference and that's given me a kind of space to experiment creatively and kind of come to poetry on my own. And then a lot of the connection remains with the U.S. in terms of like, I mean, here too, with lots of like wonderful poets in our community and then, um, you know, and then beyond that to the U.S., um, but yeah, it's ever evolving. <laughs> it's ever evolving. Um, and has all these, all these sides to it. How about for you, Karen? I think for me, that this is so true. Um, I was brought up by, by Yiddish speakers. Uh, and we spoke Yiddish at home, but I was brought up in the United States. 
even though I was born in England. And, and uh, um, that perspective of having a different language, uh, of, of looking at things with some kind of irony because you're coming from a different place. It gives you a different um, a view of how to see things and then also how to say things. Your, yeah. your language is not automatic. Yeah. You have to think about it. As, you, as Amy said, you think about the word glass. Um, it doesn't just, it isn't just glass. It is and it, like the apple. Yeah, the apple. It is, and it isn't. Uh, language, uh, and, and then I, of course, you know, it's when we, I moved to Hebrew, and uh, Hebrew is a, a very, a very different kind of language, much more intense, and much more limited in, in, in vocabulary. And then you begin to, you know, you look at Hebrew and you start um, thinking about the difference in the way of where a sentence would be. Uh, expressed in Hebrew or in Yiddish. I wrote a book in Yiddish and translated into Hebrew uh, because I was playing with that idea of what happens to the experience itself when I have different language, I have different words. Um, so, so that concentration on language is probably a result of, of um, moving from language to language. And moving from experience to experience, although it could be probably other things as well. But uh, but it is an, it is a deep awareness of language that's shifting all the time that can be very positive and 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 sort of like informing you and also be of you know to the like what Sabine was talking before about how language comes from within you you know and these different languages at least for me like they do exist. They, they, they co-mingle, you know, and they're, they're there. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it, it's, I don't know, manifests in all kinds of, uh, kinds of ways. I, I see all kinds of people here on the screen. I don't see everybody on the screen. But I see, and there's a lot of people who keep writing me that they can't get in. But I see all these people on the screen who have another language, who, who have this other kind of perspective, Hungarian, uh, 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 Hebrew. Uh, let me just say there, there's a, there's a number of people here who understand that experience of not taking language for granted, and therefore not taking experiences for granted. You you sift them; so they go through a consciousness that um, uh, sometimes uh, doesn't exist when you have one language. Now. English is one of those languages where the, most people have one language, English. Um, uh, but uh, in Europe, uh, I think our parents, my parents, uh, Ricky's parents spoke six, seven different languages, uh, uh, eight languages. Uh, uh, my father would quote uh, Latin poems to me and Greek poems, and it was uh, it was it was part of it. When I had a sound check with my rock group the first time, and the uh, the accordionist who has a, you know a minor role in the group said, you know, they said get up and check the microphone. He started quoting Pish Pushkin in Russian, and I said, what? <laughs> Where are we living? <laughs> uh, we don't have that language. We don't usually have that richness of, of uh, alternatives, of possibilities uh, of seeing things. I think, and I think that we're missing something because of it. When we don't have enough. And if I, if I may add, Karen, um, I think that it's very important for a writer to feel as an outsider. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have a big advantage over other writers, sorry to say. <laughs> uh, we went through the pain of exile, mm -hmm. uh, but um, in the end we, we won this power. Mm -hmm. Being an outsider, feeling as an outsider is, is a big power. 
And then words become your home, right? Sorry. Words become your home. They become your your language. Writing is your becomes um, your homeland. Wherever you come from, wherever you move around, you have your language. We have language to write. Yeah, but the language also changes. You know, it's, it's not a fossil. It it absorbs. It's like a sponge. We are. I think as foreigners or we, we have this ability to absorb everything that's around. Um, and so we, we don't have a dead language. See what I mean? Our language is always alive. It's always alive. Yeah. Always and I, yeah, I was going to say something about the just going back to like Karen's poem and Sabine's poem, which like struck, I think a lot of people is just very profound and sort of brave and, and bringing up a lot of those really painful and, and, and difficult experiences. And um, I wonder if like that distance or some sense of out, outsiderness is what enables or sort of like gives, also gives room for the, like a safe place for it to emerge. Like, um, yeah, that's what comes to mind. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, sometimes the, that you need that kind of uh, distance and um, to be able to relate to things like this, to, 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 uh, to any kind of uh, hard, difficult, I say difficult situation, tragedies, uh, violence. I think that, that sometimes you really need that. But I have, I have, um, I have sinned. I, I promised you ten minutes, and then we got started. Uh, ten minutes of discussion, and then we got started. And I, I couldn't stop. I don't know about the rest of you, but I just couldn't. Uh, I thought that these, these poets I've been honored to to appear with tonight were just so fascinating, and and I keep looking at the the audience here and I keep saying, I know, I know you've got to go. I know you've got other things to do, but you're all so amazing. So I want to thank you very, very much for this amazing, I think wonderful evening. And I hope, uh, I hope we will see you again soon, all of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you for organizing it. Beautiful. Karen, thanks for everything. Yeah. It was it was Sabine. It was Sabine. Thank you all. <laughs> nice to meet you, Amy. Nice to meet you all. Yeah. You all. Right. I hope I get to Tel Aviv someday to meet you for real. Without our masks. Absolutely. <laughs> soon, soon. Yeah. <laughs> Night to all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom Tova. Shana Tova. Karen, thanks for all your hard work for this, really. Is she still on? She's gone. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Ezra. Bye-bye. <laughs> Good night. Thank you, Ezra. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye, Nelly.